morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much for making time to be with us. I'm really looking forward to a relatively fast-paced, happy, engaging morning with you. What I would so appreciate, so appreciate, after a year of Zoom fatigue and after a year of online events, every hour, on the hour, consistently, and with home invasion now fully in play, I would so appreciate it if you would switch your cameras on. I would love to engage with you. I would love to see faces. I'm desperate to see human beings in real form. Um, I've done a number of webinars uh, right across the world. They are the most dreadful, horrible, horrible things to do. It sucks you dry. It makes you feel inhuman. And at South Africans, we are tactile people. We need to see each other. We need to see expressions. So please switch your cameras on. I promise you, most of you are far better looking than I am. So there's nothing wrong and nothing to be concerned about. And I will take you seriously, despite the environment you're sitting in. And with that, um, I'm going to ask you to mute your mics, switch your cameras on. That brilliant piece of music, that incredible piece of music, which has carried me personally through COVID and kept me motivated and interested and thinking and engaged is from Hans Zimmer. It's a song called You're So Cool. And some of you might remember, what was that movie that he did? Um, I don't remember the movie. It was the theme song for a really old movie, a really good movie, quite a violent movie, despite the beauty in that music. So if you enjoyed it, Hans Zimmer is the guy to go to. I'm gonna get straight into it. There is gonna be a lot of engagement in this process. I'm gonna be asking you questions as much as hopefully you'll be asking me. True romance, thank you, Papa. True romance. Bring the chat to life. Bring the chat to life. I'm gonna be looking at the chat as a guide to answers to the questions I'm posing. I'm going to make a massive effort to ensure that I can address all the questions that are put onto the chat. We'll be running a few polls. Please engage with them. Once I click to the next slide, we are gonna go and we are gonna go at pace. So look at the chat, engage on the chat, say hi in the chat, say good morning on the chat, say where are you from, which part of the world, which part of the country, what hovel did you creep out of? All of us came from somewhere. Let's see who's on screen, let's see from each other, and let's engage. So, very quick introduction. My name is Pablo Fatidis. I'm one of the co-founders of Auric. Um, I'm an investor. I've written a book or two, uh, one of them most recently during COVID. I do quite a bit of speaking, but most importantly, the best time of my life was spent in front of a business owner, a real human being doing real things, and very often not spoken about the true heroes of every economy. A very brief introduction to Auric. Auric was established to solve one problem alone. Fact, 94.6% of businesses started fail to sell. And I'm not talking about startups. The startup failure rates are dreadful. I'm talking about that 20, 30 year old business that's provided good income for its owner, it's provided opportunity for staff, it's provided income for the family. And in the last mile, there's no exit. It's a terrible fact. To solve this, we started, built, and sold 12 businesses. They did really well, but the most interesting thing about those businesses, and now we're going back, although I'm only 25 years old, we're going back about 14 years. And what happened with those businesses over the nine-year period, we recognized that 50% of them, half of them, took half the time to build to the same value as the first handful, and took about a third of the investment. Practice makes perfect. There really is value in that statement. With every subsequent business, we understood how to do things more effectively, more efficiently, and having an engineering finance background, my co-founder, a finance legal background, shouldn't trust lawyers. Anthony Popper, I see you there. In any event, um, we had a structured approach to building businesses, escalating businesses, accelerating businesses and growing businesses. We've now managed to offer that to over 2,700 SMEs right around the world. Well, not right around the world, in four continents. 
or four countries, the US, Europe, a collection of countries there, the United Kingdom and South Africa. And the average annual compound growth rate of those businesses had sat, has sat at 29.8% despite the environments we're in. I'm gonna be sharing the stories from that collection of businesses with you. Incidentally, SME, dreadful word, horrible word. I use it because it's popular language as much as I despise it. For us, an SME in South Africa is a business doing around 12 million odd rands a year, up to about 300 million rands a year. That should cater to most of us on screen. There are a few of us doing slightly below that for now, but not for long. The way that we're gonna spend our time is I'm gonna move very, very quickly uh, with an analogy. It's a famous analogy, it's a terrible analogy. I repeat the analogy because it's so valuable. Analogies are important to give you perspective, to not make things personal, to give you a different outside view in on your business. I'm gonna to talk to five growth impediments. And with that, I'm gonna to talk to what we see businesses doing and what we do with businesses that we work with make sure that they're going to make up everything that they have lost in 2021 from 2020. Uh, please put questions through as you go along and as you go through. So let's start very quickly with analogy. Building a business is like saving a ship. I promise you it is. I promise you it is. Think of the logic behind it. If you sail a ship, when you leave a port and you go out into that open sea, if your destination is not clear, you will run out of food, fuel, and water looking for a place to go. But if you set your destination before you set sail, you know how long it's going to take to get you there. Therefore, if it's a 10-day journey, you know that you need 12, 30 days of food, fuel, and water. When you set sail, you need to work with the end in mind. All of us as business owners need to recognize there are only two destinations for every single one of us. It's either a successful exit and sale or it's a closure. The stats are against that, 94.6%. The next thing is that you can't sail a ship without a crew. A crew needs to understand what to do, where to do, how to do it. And a good crew is a purposeful crew. When the storms hit, as they have this year, the good crew on a ship knows exactly what to do to keep that ship sailing, to keep it moving forward, to keep it safe. It's no different to a business. Having the right people do the right thing at the right time is essential. There are two places for us to be on a ship. If you look at the ship over here, below deck there is the engine room. And the engine room is dark. It has no sight outside. It's got this creaking lamp and these big diesel engines that chunk away to turn the propeller to give the ship forward momentum. Our businesses need forward momentum. The engine room has to be chunking for 12 months of the year because our costs run for 12 months of the year. The other place we can be is up on the bridge. And on the bridge, you have a 360 degree view around you. The purpose of being on the bridge is to steer the ship to the destination. So we have one of two places we can be as captains of our own ships, either in the engine room, ensuring that we have forward momentum and propulsion, or up on the bridge, ensuring that that momentum is moving in the right direction. Hold on to that image. My question to you all is where do you expect to be in the next 36 to 60 months? Put your ideas on the chat. Let's see what comes through. Let's see what the engagement looks like. Where in the next three to five years do you want your business to be? Three to five years, short period of time. Time runs out, it really does. Oh my word. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing. Oh, the outlook for 2021, I'm gonna end with that. Kyle, I'll give you the answer to 2021 in the last slide. I've got a very, very clear sense of what it will look like. Jenny, sold. Sold for profit. Or sold through a closure. 
If you're going to say sold, put a number down. This idea that you sell your business and you get what you get is nonsense. The exiting of a business is a mathematical process. I will talk about how we get that right over here. But you must put a figure down and you must aim for that figure because if it's mathematical, it's doable. There are four or five levers that impact the value of a business. I will talk to those levers and I will show you how you have absolute control over them today. Establish with a good crew. Yep, that's a good place to be. We're going to talk about what makes a good crew. And we'll talk more importantly about establishment. Establishment suggests that you have a brand beyond yourself, that people recognize your business for being something. The mathematical formula has not been, no, 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 no. The mathematical formula, Donna, there's no mathematical formula that gets impacted by a crisis. Crises come and go. Guys, we're all living through a crisis at the moment, but every single one of you has lived through many crises leading up to this crisis. And here's an absolute truth, and I'm so sorry to say this, but there will be many more crises ahead. Learning how to capitalize on crises and thrive on crises is a business leadership skill that we all need to own and possess. We'll talk to that too. Happy to get back to where we were pre-lockdown and global travel bans. Uh, we were running a successful little lodge and it will continue to be successful. It will continue to be successful. In Reset, Rebuild, Reignite, I talk about how you preserve capital. It's a completely separate presentation altogether, but really you need to preserve what it is, let's call it the essence of the business to make sure you fight another day. So there are quite a few things coming through from, from Mayor Deval um, to be the most efficient niche provider of our services in the industry. Oh, I love that. I love the idea of efficiencies. And we'll talk about how you make that engine turn extremely efficiently. From an order point of view, we believe in only one thing. There's only one destination that all of us should be sailing to. We call it an asset of value. Let's just unpack the word asset a little bit. Because, you know, in business literature, in business media, we use a lot of words. We talk about assets, we talk about next level growth, we talk about pivoting, but no one has really thought beyond the word and what the word implies how to construct a business to achieve all those things the best analogy to describe an asset is this we have a hundred bucks we're going to invest the hundred bucks into a share on the stock exchange we buy it for a hundred rand and we're going to hold it for five years at the end of five years what do you want from the share you bought you want to be able to sell it for at least 300 Rand. The difference between 300 Rand on the exit of the share, the 100 Rand you paid, in other words, 200 Rand, is your capital growth. The second thing you want from that share is that every year you want to earn a dividend. And the dividend might be 15 Rand a year over five years. We call that income growth. So an asset, two of the three features, Number one, it must have capital growth. And number two, it must have income growth. What's the third thing? If you can't sell it, you can't trade it. If you can't trade it, you can't enjoy the benefit of capital growth. Those are the three primary features of an asset. It needs to create value into the future, hold the value, and be tradable. An asset of value as we see it, within the world of business has a number of layers to it. The first thing is that the business has a brand and we will talk about what the word brand means. It's not about advertising. A brand is an experience, a feeling in the heads, hearts, hands, and pockets of your customers and clients. The next thing is it must operate through a series of activities organized into systems. Marketing is a system to generate leads. Sales is a system to convert leads. Operations is a system to fulfill your promises to your clients and so on. 
The third thing is you need a good crew. You need a purposeful crew. Because if I'm buying your ship and you ain't got no crew, how do I even begin sailing it? The third thing, it must be growing, constantly growing. If you're not growing, you are dying. And then the final thing, it has to be independent of you. If it's not, it's simply not sellable. So I want to run a quick poll, which Pippa will put up for me. And my question to you is, what makes your business special in the eyes of your customer? And whilst you're completing this poll, I want to tell you the story of this particular ship on the screen. This ship first sailed in the very, very early 1800s. And it sailed from Rotterdam port or Amsterdam port to New York. It was one of the first ships that carried Dutch immigrants into the United States. In those days, you can see the ship itself, a lot of ropes, a lot of sails made of wood. Things would go wrong. The Atlantic was rough. It was a tough place to traverse. And the way that the organization that owned the ship decided to communicate to its clients and customers, what makes us special is they used a figurehead. If you look at the figurehead, it's a lion. And a lion represents brave, bold, determined, strong. The message from the captain to its passengers is get on board this ship as opposed to any other ship because we sail in a straight line. We get through any weather. We are brave, we are bold, we are strong, just like you. The figurehead, absolutely important on a ship. It communicates what makes a ship special in the eyes of its customers. So if we look at what we have on screen, um, Pips is a sharing. Attendees are now viewing the polls. Finish the polls. Stop viewing the polls. Are oh, you viewing the polls? Okay. Price. Price doesn't make a special. I love that. Fantastic. Or two percent it does. Product, service, and features. Mm, I'm going to have a fight with thirty-one percent of you this morning, and I've got my boxing gloves on. Your service. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Relationships are my word. Mm. Okay, we'll talk about the impact of relationships. One of the second last slides that I share with you is I'm going to turn and put a buyer's hat on. I'm going to be buying your business and valuing it. And the questions I ask are going to point right to the relationships. Quality, you're on a good wicket, but it's very low. So we have a sense what makes your business special in the eyes of your customers as you see it predominantly in three areas, the product and service features, the service that you offer, and relationships. Let's see what the rest out there are doing. So we move on. Brand positioning, what does it mean? You know, in South Africa alone, there are over 1.3 million .co.za websites. It excludes all the .coms. It excludes the recent .ios. It excludes the .org, .zas. It excludes all the other websites. Just in our country alone, we are competing with 1.3 million websites, which is the shop front of our business to all our clients and customers. Responding to a competitive, noisy business environment has become increasingly hard. There are more and more people going into business out of sheer necessity. And the concentration of companies and businesses within the mid-tier SMEs in South Africa sits at around 150,000 businesses. So think about what sector you're in, what industry you're in, and try and figure out what makes you special in amongst all the other contenders out there. It's not easy to get right. And it's not easy to get right because we've been taught poorly around it. Here's the history. So in 1771, Rolf Waldo Emerson, you can see him over there. He's clearly intelligent. He's clearly important because he was wearing a tie and a jacket or a bow tie and a jacket. And in 1771, that was afforded only to the most literate, well-to-do people. He was the founding father of the United States of America, an essayist, a poet, a thinker, a 
politician. And he wrote, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. And in 1771, he argued that the product and service features of what you offer is a winning value proposition. Get them right and customers will come to you. And in 1771, he was right because we didn't even have fridges. We barely had light. There were hardly any products out there. Okay, there was a cold pistol and a bottle of whiskey, but beyond, oh, and a horse. But literally beyond that, there wasn't much else. This man took him very seriously. In 1922, he was quipped saying, build, you can have any Model T Ford you want for so long as it is, who knows the answer? Famous, famous words. Black. Black. Absolutely right. Henry Ford innovated the automobile into common culture. He competed with the horse and he won. He established the assembly line, the production line. Products were becoming popular and he was the first person to argue price. Pavlo, we've just lost your audio for a second. Am I back? I am back. Okay, I've been having problems with the Dell machine for an entire year. This individual then came about and he's around, he's still around, he remains around. He was known as the father and is known as the father of advertising. And he argued in the very late 50s, early 60s, no, 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 no. It's not about product features, Ralph Walter Emerson. It's not about price, Henry Ford. It's about understanding your customers and organizing them into segments. So we, for example, all fall into an SME segment. The banks see us as a segment called SME businesses. So do the insurers, so does government. So do the networks. So do most service providers. And can I just have a quick show of hands? Who loves their bank? And who loves their network? If I look across the screen, let me get to the second screen and the third screen. Well, no one's raising their hands. Okay. What does it tell you about market segmentation? Which is what's actively taught today in every single MBA class around the world, saying that unless you understand how to segment the market, you will never succeed in marketing. You will never succeed in selling. And they are arguably two of the most important features of building a successful business. So what we get taught really resembles a thinking dating back to the 60s, arguably an improvement from the early 1900s and an advancement from 1771. So I'll tell you what we've seen win consistently in the last three and a half to four years. He or she running a business that argues we exist solely to solve one thing. Let's call it a problem. For a well-defined group of customers who want a competitive price with good products and features. That's who was winning from about five years back. If you think about it in your lives, you do not spend one penny on anything that does not remove a problem for you. A question we should all be asking is what problem do we solve and for who? And what is the cost of that problem if it's not solved for the customers and clients we serve? To the extent that you can answer that specifically and accurately is the extent that you understand what business you're in. So this worked five years ago. It's not working that well now. The edge of competition today has been fought around creating an experience. Positioning is defined as follows from an auric perspective, or at least from an asset of value perspective. If you try and serve everyone 
all the time, everywhere. You become nothing to everyone, anytime, all the time. From a business perspective, we need to narrow who it is that we serve. We need to understand them intimately in terms of the problems they have, how the problems emerge, and what the cost of the problem is. And then most importantly, they need to have a spectacular experience in learning about us, engaging with us, and being serviced by us. And I will prove it. Does anyone know who this lady is? Is she familiar to any of you? I'm looking at the chat. I'm not seeing anything come through. No. My word. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get with it. This is one of the most remarkable people. In March, April, she had 10 million. <laughs> Kyle, no idea. That's terrible. Wesley, no, that's not acceptable from you. Six, seven months ago, she had 10,000 followers on Twitter. She had about 300 on YouTube. She had about 1,500 followers on TikTok. And then she started to solve the real problem that people were experiencing. This is how she did it. We hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. Right. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that so that you're going to have to use medical doctors with. But it sounds, it sounds interesting. You're right, Neville. Sarah Cooper, Karen, absolutely right. The problem she solved is that the American president insisted on doing all the briefings during the COVID early entree into the United States. The things he was saying, the way he was saying it, were intolerable to a lot of Americans. And what she did is she created an experience for most Americans to understand the points that Trump was communicating in a way where you would not have to engage with, see, or hear Trump directly. She built a following of millions in social media and a month ago, she launched her Netflix career. She won a, a show on Wednesday nights with Jimmy Kimmel. And she, in six months, has become one of the leading comedians in the United States, pretty much in the same ranks as Trevor Noah, South African, Jimmy Kimmel, um, and Stephen Colbert, plus a few others. To the extent that you understand the audience you serve, and you can be clear, and you understand the problem they have, and you can give them a good experience in having it solved. It's what gives you relevance in the minds of your clients and customers. They search then for you. Three examples, a watch retailer we worked with, 2009, 2012, straight after the global credit crunch, the watch retailer sells watches that start at around 180, 200,000 Rand, and end off at about 600 odd thousand rand. Hands up quickly, how many of you are wearing a watch of that significance? Uh, good, Mornay, congratulations. Uh, Johan, no doubt you wearing a watch, a 600 thousand rand watch, yeah? Not many of you. Okay, well that says something. What's interesting over here is he argued to us that watches of that price are luxury products. We did some interesting work with him and discovered that, in fact, he solved four problems for customers and clients. What do you think they were on the chat, more or less? More or less. Who buys a watch for 500,000 Rand? Status? Absolutely right. Sean, one of the four problems he solved was to do with status, where people feel insecure and they need to show the world 
that they've arrived, that they're successful, that they're people of relevance. A movable asset. Someone's been reading a book here. <laughs> a movable asset. Absolutely right. Somebody would walk into the store and buy 16 Rolex watches at half a million rand a pop for himself, his wife, or herself and her husband, their kids, their family, the uncle, the aunt, the gran, and everyone else who was traveling to Orlando for a business conference. And once arriving there, they would liquidate those watches for the same value that they bought them and move money outside of the country. And there were also a lot of money launderers involved where they would wash money through the watches. When this business understood that they solved four problems, immediately it enabled them to market their proposition differently. And when clients and customers walked into the store, position why the uh, watch itself would be of value to that particular uh, customer. During 2009, 2012, when the world was collapsing around us, they grew an average of 24.6% annual compound growth rates. Another example, an industrial baker, met him 14 years ago, was doing 62 million rands a year, started the business at the age of 30, was 54 at the time. That's a long run in the business was sitting at 62 million rand and doing what he had done for 30 years before, simply understanding how to position his business differently into the market, has seen him close his books at December the year before last at just over 1.17 uh, billion rand. And a final example, a legal practice. The professional services space is so interesting. You know, how do you build a legal practice when really it relies on your skills, your education? And I get asked this by professional engineers, by people in the medical fraternity, by people in architecture, anyone offering a professional service, how do you build a professional service into an asset? This particular practice was attempting to offer contracts and legal advice and support to all people, all time, across all things. Over a period of time, based in the UK, they narrowed down to focus only on divorce law. They understood when divorces take place, at what stage after that first marriage, what is the second stage after that marriage. So typically there was a seven year itch, there was a midlife crisis. They targeted all their marketing to people within that demographic and they have enjoyed an annual compound growth rate of 38.2% over the last three years. System driven. It's powerful. So once you've understood who you serve, what problem you solve for them, and what experience they want to back you and support you, you now have to translate that into a set of systems. It's all the primary commercial functions. Marketing to generate leads. The only measure and only outcome, Dylan. Sales to convert leads. From what, it's the only thing that matters for sales. And sales people can go. They can go. They can talk. They've got the gift of the gab. You've got to get the deals done. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the function of sales, to convert the leads. Operations, to fulfill the promises you made to your clients and customers. Administration, to make it effortless, neat, clean, a great experience. Your people systems, right people doing the right thing at the right time. Money systems, is there enough oxygen in the business so the business can sprint when it sees opportunities? There are around 186 systems that get built to create a system of delivery because all those activities working together create one single system that articulates the positioning that you have fought so hard to understand and win. There's six elements in every system. If you think about what a system is, activities in a sequence that can be measured, most importantly can be taught with a job description and can properly be remunerated. If you think about how you, for example, market your business, you might do it through a series of campaigns to an audience that you want to reach. The campaigns themselves are made up of activities in a sequence that can be measured it can be taught so someone can run the campaign for you. 
It needs to be described. And most importantly, it needs to earn a return. When you get that right, that's what happens to the business. These systems are the cogs that drive the engine, turning the propeller to give you momentum. If you think about it, I understand what makes my business special, the eyes of my customer. I've understood it in terms of a problem, and most importantly, I've understood it in terms of the experience. And then I've gone and created, right across the functions of my business, systems to generate that experience 24-7, 365. It's the early stage of understanding how to create a sales engine that runs for 12 months to support an operating overhead cost structure that definitely runs for 12 months. So here's a question to you. Let's run a poll on this, Pips. That's you. Well, that's Charlie Chaplin. But how often are you pulled into the engine room in your own business to go and fix a cog that's not working properly or not coordinating with one other cog? And just as you seem to feel that you've gotten things right, so that you can go back up onto the bridge and focus on sales and focus on growth and focus on innovation and focus on leadership. Do you get hauled back into the engine of the business because there's something wrong in the marketing cog or the sales cog and the marketing cogs aren't working well together or operations is moaning that marketing is selling the wrong thing, administrations arguing that the pricing and costing structures are wrong and the contract that was signed by sales doesn't correlate to the ability of the business to deliver on that basis. It's happened to all of us. If it hasn't happened to you, my word, you're either not building a business, you're either not growing or you're not doing something. Because here's the thing, when you grow, those cogs become complicated. The more growth you have, the bigger the cogs need to be because the heavier the ship you're moving, the simpler the cogs are, the easier it is to keep that ship moving. What is the cog that fails you most? What is the cog that pulls you in most? Marketing to generate leads is, oh, the second one, operations to fulfill the leads. Ability to deliver on the promises to customers. Most of us are experiencing that. And then we have more or less, well, not quite equal. Lead generation, getting customers to knock on our door. Converting them, we seem to be doing okay. Procurement, not much. We've got a good sense of where we all are. So now we've got our positioning right. We've built a system of delivery. What's the next thing you need? We need system operators. We need the right people doing the right thing at the right time. On the chat, just share with me who your dream employee would be. What would they do for you? Ashley, you, you have won a lottery. And the lottery is that you're going to employ someone who has remarkable skill in any area. Who would it be that you want to have on board? Bongiwe, who's your right guy? Let me see on the chat. <laughs> or, or of the above. <laughs> oh, that was related to the problems. <laughs> Elon Musk, George, are you, are you looking for innovation? <laughs> okay, I can see that. All the admin in my business, oh, Donna, oh, I know the feeling. It's my weakest point. I really struggle with it. CM, CRM, Customer Relationship Management Lead. Oh, and you can also make cappuccinos. I couldn't agree more with that. I think we've drunk more cappuccinos this year than we've had any other year. The coffee industry must be booming. Marketing and sales. An all-rounder who can run the whole business for me. Imagine that, Kyle. Imagine <laughs> you could find a silver bullet that just does it all for you and does it perfectly each and every time. Donovan, who would you be looking for? Who is that one individual, an individual who's mission focused, understands their impact on the business, works with the team, 
focuses on being the solution and not the problem. They learn from their mistakes and improve on their work as they progress. Wow, Wesley. Is that aspirant? Might it be you? A clone of me, Jenny. I know that feeling. At least I used to. A lead generator, hunter, business development. Yeah, I agree. Well, no, Sean, the dream team wasn't offered. It was one individual, one silver bullet that you could get on board to solve your problems for you. Billy, who would you get on board? More like who's the dream team, unique combinations. So let's have a look at it. From an asset of value point of view, we believe a team is defined as the right people doing the right thing at the right time. Now that's almost impossible to get right. If you don't understand your positioning, in other words, what makes you special in the eyes of your customer? And once you've gotten that right, unless you have built systems to deliver on that consistently, how do you employ people to do what? If you employ somebody to run operations, what does it mean? If you have an operational system, activities in a sequence that can be measured, that can be taught, that can be shown in a job description and can be rewarded, you're in a situation where you can employ for the first time a really good operator in operations. When we employ people into a business and we say we're looking for people in marketing or people in sales, or people in ops, or people in admin, or people in strategy, or people in innovation. What do those words mean? They exist mostly in our heads. They exist extensively across business lexicon. The only person who cares ultimately is your client and customer. To the extent that they see you as a business that solves a problem for them, through an experience that they want consistently, which is then articulated in systems that you build, much like cogs turning the propeller. It puts you in a position where you can then get the right people to do the right thing. On a ship, every person operates a system, be it above board, below decks, in the gully, in the engine room, in the anchor house, in navigation. Everyone knows exactly what they ought to be doing, when they ought to be doing it, and how they ought to be doing it. It's our job as business owners to be crisp and clear around what makes our business special, what experience we need to create, to build out the systems to deliver that, and then to empower people to power the systems. Getting that right can only happen if the previous two steps have emerged. So I'm gonna share a formula with you. Um, Rolf, what would this be worth to you? If I can show you how to manufacture time for yourself in your business, what would you be prepared to pay? I'm gonna run an auction. Ernst, are you gonna put in a bid? Mosimani, show me the money, my brother. Selo, how much would you pay for that? I'm looking at my chat and there's not much coming through. Maybe I should skip this slide. Okay, so Jenny, we've got 20,000 Rand. Listen, buddy, I wasn't born yesterday. Priceless doesn't put money in my pocket. Give me a number. I will share it exclusively with the person who bids the highest value. Oh. <laughs> Jenny, you've been popped by Neville. He's 100 Rand up on you. And for this particular formula, because I'm selling it once, I have to go with, okay, Wesley, well, no, Roth, the highest bid doesn't mean anything. Put a number down. At the moment, Wesley's put in half a million Rand. Oh, I beg your pardon, 500 million Rand. Uh, Wesley, you and I'll have a conversation afterwards. I'm going to skip this slide um, and move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the formula to manufacture time. And time will also, this formula will also generate predictable growth 
and put you in a position where you can spend more time leading rather than doing. The first part of the formula is to get your positioning right. And I say this to all of you again and again and again, because I argue it's one of the toughest things to get right in a business. If you don't understand who you serve in very clear terms, what problem you solve for them, and what experience they want, in other words, the customer or client buying experience, that will get them to pay attention to you, engage with you, and support you through the service or product you offer. It's a non-starter. You will spend your time being all things to all people all the time, and you will constantly be pulled from pillar to post. You have to get this piece right first. Thereafter, if you don't articulate that into a system of delivery, the clarity, the conciseness, the simplicity of building a business that will constantly deliver on this positioning becomes almost impossible, irrespective as to the size of your business. And finally, without a system of delivery, you will never get the right people to do the right thing at the right time. And for so long as you don't have the right people doing the right thing at the right time, and for so long as you don't have a system of delivery in play, and for so long as your positioning remains unclear and not crisp, you will constantly be pulled into the engine room activities that generate propulsion in any business. Getting these three things right in that order releases the most precious thing we all have available. I want to run a quick calculation with you. Remember these watches, some of them have come back into fashion. I used one of these to get through my accounting. Oh, no, I never said that. We weren't allowed calculators. I never said that. Ignore that. Can you scrap that? Pippa, can you delete that? I didn't say that. It wasn't me. I want to get a sense from all of you. How long have you been in the business? How long have you been doing what you've been doing? On the chat, give me some numbers. Louise, how long have you been doing what you've been doing? You look 20 years old, so it can't be that long. Now, well, you look 15. How long have you been in the game? Two and a half years, 20 years, 10 years, 29 years. Oh, the numbers are flowing in. <sighs> Kyle, three years. Karen, 30 years. Louis, 25 years. From the day I was born, in other words. Brendan, 16 years. Johan, 18 years. I didn't know that, my friend. Eight years. So here's a calculation for you. It's argued that it takes 10,000 hours to become expert. So 10,000 hours is around four years. Four years of full-time focus, concentration, and effort in the business. A lot of us have been at, at the game for more than four years. It means, Billy, that we should be expert at whatever it is that we are doing in our businesses. We know it. We know our product. We know our service. We know what we're doing. Brendan, you know everything about rubber compounds. You really do. You really do. Not everything, but you know hell of a lot. Probably one of the top experts in the country. Here's the thing. If you've been in your business for five years, it's about 12,000 hours. 25 years, 65,000 hours. And I want to ask you a question. If you think about what an expert consultant in your industry, Jason, would charge per hour, what would that number be? If you were a consultant, and you were in your industry consulting clients with expert insight and advice on the product or service you offer. Andrew, what would you be charging on an hourly basis? Two and a half thousand rand? Mayor, three and a half thousand rand? Daniel, what would you be charging? You're a pure consultant, you go into the chemical sector, You've got four or five degrees behind you, because you do. What would you charge on an hourly basis as an expert consultant? So the numbers are sitting in the thousands. I want you to run a quick calculation, really for yourselves. And I'm gonna build up my trusty companion. 
this guy here. If you've been running for about 15 years in your industry, in your sector, in your business, and you're arguing that an expert consultant, because remember, 15 years, 38,000 hours, you're an expert. 38,000 hours working full time at 2,500 Rand is a very, very, very big number. It sits at 95 million Rand of earnings. So from a business owner's perspective, you have enjoyed income from your business. The income plus the capital that you expect to attain when you exit your asset. If you've been in the game for 15 years, needs to come in and around that number, surely. Because if at 10,000 hours you're an expert and you've been in the game, you need to have in the, the back of your mind a valuation that says, what have I earned over the years in my business? And what is the gap that I need to make up when I exit the business through a capital gain? Surely? We're all the single biggest investors in our business. We should be thinking like shareholders. Food for thought. Run some numbers. Quick question to everyone. Let's run a poll on this, Pips. Where are you spending or investing most of your time? In the engine room to generate propulsion or on the bridge to lead the team and organize the direction of the business? Well, the polls are fascinating to watch. It's a little bit like looking at some of the states in the US between Trump and Biden. And the polls are starting to settle. We've got more people in the engine room at the moment. Majority of time. So what would the majority be? 60, 70% of the time. Bridge or engine room, bridge or engine room. So we're sitting at about a 70, 30 split, 70 in the engine room. And guys, it should be more this year than any previous year. Because when the business is in crisis, you've got to climb back into the engine room to maintain propulsion. Direction is very, very hard to attain when the seas are choppy and the storm is wild. So I wouldn't be surprised if most of us have been back in the engine room this year. If we build the business right and we've manufactured time, it means that we should be spending 70% up on the bridge. 70% as an average should be up on the bridge of the ship. The function, if you think about what your true, true function is as a business owner, it is to build a system that solves a problem for well-defined groups of clients through a particular experience and is empowered and powered through people you employ. That's in truth what you should be spending your time doing. You should not be doing marketing. You should not be doing selling. You should not be doing operations. You should not be doing administration. With 70% of your time, you should be focusing from the bridge on building a culture across the organization where you mobilize and motivate and inspire and support your team. Delegation is essential over here. Impossible to delegate with any level of certainty and confidence if you don't know what you're delegating, hence the value of systems. I delegate you, Brendan, to run this system for me. When somebody runs a system and they're well suited to the system and they perform, it builds confidence. And that confidence creates meaning and value in the life of that individual. None of us want to do things that we can't perform at. All of us want to continue to do more of what we are good at. As we move through life, we want to play more and more to our strengths. Finding the right system operator for the right system is a win-win for not only your customers, but for that individual too. And therefore, it's a win for you. 30% of your time should be focused on growth. Next level growth is where you increase your revenues at a faster rate than you increase your costs. You want to see a growing EBITDA number. 
a net profit before tax number. To the extent that you're growing your net profit before tax, it means that you're running an efficient business and it means that you're increasing the capital value of your business. If you simply grow revenues and you grow your operating costs in line with your revenues, so yes, there's a higher quantum of profit, but not a higher percentage of profit, you run the risk of creating a more complex business and that business has more risk. It's also not attractive in valuations. And then finally, when you're on the bridge, that's when you do the reset to rebuild, to reignite. That's when you make the adjustments during a crisis, post a crisis, to remain relevant to the changing needs of customers and clients. That's where you make the changes to your business to improve efficiencies, or you bring on a new product, or you chase a new market segment, who you only then bring on board once you've understood what problem you solve for them and what experience they want. And then who you only bring on board if you're sure that your system of delivery can accommodate them. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what you, after 10,000 hours, should be doing 70% of the time in your business. To the extent that you aren't, suggests positioning is not clear and the system of delivery needs work first. I want to start ending off with a thought. I'm gonna tell you how valuation works. There are two strategies. By looking at those two icons, can you guess them? Let's see who can guess this icon. Icon one, icon two. What are the two strategies? And these are the only two ways that valuation works, incidentally. A thumb suck. Yeah, it's fingers crossed. The strategy is called hope. Oh no, who spoilt it? Billy, really. Yeah, Billy, hope and build. Yep, Donovan, hope and build. Leslie, hope and effort. No, effort doesn't yield valuation. Valuation is constructed. Billy, Donovan have got it right. Johan, guess? No, not a guess, hope. It's not guess and hope. No, 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 hope, yes. Guys, 95% of people simply hold thumbs and maybe one or 2% actually construct a valuation for their business. And let me show you the evidence of it. Here it is globally. 94.6% of businesses fail to sell. Only 5.4 businesses started ever exit successfully. In family businesses, as we move through the generations, 27.3% of businesses going from the founding generation to the succeeding generation survive. 5.4% in the second generation survive. The stats work against us. So let me give you a sense of our valuation works and why you are in control and you can deliver a valuation you want. A business works more or less from a valuation point of view as a multiple of your EBITDA, as your EBITDA. So in other words, a net profit after tax, you can apply multiple to it, it varies from sector to industry ever so slightly. On average in South Africa, that multiple is two times your net profit after tax, uh, uh, before tax. Two times your profit before tax. Okay, so you all know what tax, you all know what EBITDA numbers you're producing, multiply it by two, that's more or less your valuation. How do we get it up? How do we get it up? The first thing I ask you when I buy your business is what makes your business special? If you turn around and say to me, what sets me apart from my many, many other competitors is I have a very clear definition of who I serve, what problem they have, and what experience they need in having it solved. I'm going to add half a multiple to your two. My next question to you is, well, how do you solve that problem and who does it for you? Because what I'm asking here 
is whether you are involved in that process. If you think about it logically, George, I'm buying your business. Tomorrow you won't be there. To the extent that you can show me you have built a system of delivery to deliver what makes you special in the eyes of your customers, I add a point. We've gone now from two to three as a multiple. The next thing I'm saying is who does it? And Daniel, if I see it's you who does it, it means you do not have a transferable business. If I can see a team operates those systems and the team is mo mo motivated, mobilized, capable and able, and the team is sticking around because they've been there for a while, I add another half point. If you can show me that you have grown before you intend to sell, because I'm acquiring a business with growth down the line, I add another half a point. And then when I look at this entire system that makes up the asset, which I'm acquiring, I ask you the final question. And I say to you, Stefano, without you there, can you continue to deliver this? And to the extent that you show me you can, I add a full point. That's how you take a two multiple to five or a three multiple to six. The reverse is equally true. A two multiple uses half a point, a full point, all points. If you can't demonstrate what makes you special, the system of delivery, your team and growth. If I see Philip that your business depends entirely on you, well, it's simply not sellable. There is no multiple that will buy it. Historically, two businesses I bought, I bought for a dollar a piece because these five conditions were met, especially that one. Very, very briefly, from an Auric point of view, how do we work with you? Well, today you've got momentum, you've got a team, you've got thousands of hours behind you. I'm hoping you want more and that's why you're here. Tomorrow, if we work together, the intention would only be this, to build an asset of value, to get more growth, more profit, and most importantly, more time, so that you have choices and options. It's the difference between a journey like that and a journey like that. Practically, in working with you, the first thing we do is run diagnostics across the entire business. We then establish a growth plan through a series of goals that are customized entirely around you and your business. We then put a plan in play to establish the system of delivery in order to release time for you to accelerate growth and deepen value. But we don't work with everyone because we took a decision as a business to only work where we can deliver results. And for that to be in place, we need to have a good chemistry match, which we look for. We have a process for that where we engage actively. We look to ask a question to ourselves in working with you. Andrew, in doing what we do and how we do it, will we have an impact on your business? We need to be sure of it. And the reason we need to be sure of it is because a significant portion of our cost structure depends on your growth. We go through a process where you try before you buy to establish these two elements. And if these two elements are in play, where we can be sure that we will have an impact on your business, Melanie, we encourage the relationship and hope that you encourage the relationship too for us to establish a day where we begin, start and take your business from where it is into that asset of value. I'm a few minutes over. I'm constantly a few minutes over because I constantly start one or two minutes late. I apologize for abusing your time. I want to leave you with one thought. In six months, businesses that invest strongly in growth now will maximize the inevitable market upturn, despite whether South Africa grows or not, to the extent that you build a business that's relevant through its positioning, that's articulated through systems, that has a motivated team because they are performing well, because they understand what they need to do to get the ship to the other side, will put you 90% ahead of all your previous competitors from this year. Many won't survive. Those that do will take up the slack of those customers now looking for new services. The crisis will come to an end. 
we will get back into growth. The early signs certainly within the portfolio of clients we're working with are already there. Most of our clients turned the corner in June, July. The majority were all growing revenues and profits from August onwards. 